Okay, thank you ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to hand you over now to our host, Rachel Lichtenstein. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Right, are you ready for more stories of the Essex marshes? Um, I must say, County Island seems to feature um, in many works of fiction, or possibly, um, anyway, um, many people believe it's quite commonly held knowledge that the lobster snack in on Canvey Island is featured in one of the climatic episodes of Dickens' uh, great novel, uh, Great Expectations, when Pip attempts to help his patron, Madwich, escape down the Thames. Um, I'm sure most of you know Dickens grew up in Kent and lived in London, but he often visited Essex and quite a number of his books were set around the county. The Maypole uh, in Barnaby Rudge was based on an inn in Chigwell, and Epping Forest features in sketches of a young gentleman. And we first hear um, Essex mentioned in Great Expectations when Mag Magwitch says, I first became aware of myself down in Essex, a thieving turnips. Um, the inn that's described in chapter 54 of Great Expectations is not named as the lo lobster snack, but according to one researcher on the Canvey Island Community Archive website, there have been studies on the Thames to try and pinpoint the actual inn in the book. And by following the river and its tides to see how these correspond with the description that Dickens gives in his book, Everything points to the lobster snack being this. <coughs> so in the story, Pip plans to smuggle Magwitch out of London by taking a rowing boat from Temple Stairs and rowing all night along the Thames, below Gravesend, between Kent and Essex, where the river is broad and solitary, where the waterside inhabitants are very few and where lone public houses are scattered here and there. After rowing all night, they eventually stop at, at this inn near the mouth of the estuary on an island which is surrounded by Essex marshland. And here's the description from the book. At length we descried a light in a roof and presently afterwards ran alongside a little causeway made of stones that had been picked up hard by. Leaving the rest in the boat, I stepped ashore and found the light to be in a window of a public house. It was a dirty place enough, and I dare say not unknown to smuggling adventurers. But there was a good fire in the kitchen, and there were eggs and bacon to eat, and various liquors to drink. Also, there were two bedded rooms, such as they were, the landlord said. No other company was in the house than the landlord, his wife, and a grizzled male creature, the jack of the little causeway, who was as slimy and smeary as if he had been low watermark too. With this assistant, I went down to the boat again, and we all came ashore and brought out the oars and rudder and boat hook and all else and hauled her up for the night. We made a very good meal by the kitchen fire and then apportioned the bedrooms. Herbert and Startop were to occupy one, I and I charged the other. We found the air as carefully excluded from both as if air were fatal to life and there were more dirty clothes and bandboxes under the beds than I should have thought the family possessed. But we considered ourselves well off, notwithstanding, for a more solitary place we could not have found. And this idea of the Essex marshes as the most solitary and desolate and melancholy landscape is repeated throughout a lot of fiction. Back to the Canvey Island website, there's a comment there by a lady named June Nock who states, many years ago the lobster snack was owned by a Mr and Mrs Percy Went. Mrs Went showed my late mother and myself part of a manuscript written by Charles Dickens. She told us he had stayed at the snack and had written most of Great Expectations there. Lovely idea. <laughs> um, 
So, back to the Essex Marshes, which were also the backdrops of the next two works of fiction I'm going to discuss. Um, this novel by Sylvia Townsend Warner, which was originally published in 1929, The True Heart, um, and republished again in the 70s. And also Paul Gallico's novella, published in 1941, uh, The Snow Goose. Sylvia Townsend Warner was a prolific English novelist and poet. She was born in 1878. She was a politically active communist, feminist and radical who lived for many years with her lesbian lover, the poet Valentine Auckland. Reoccurring themes in her work include a rejection of Christianity, the position of women in patriarchal societies and ambiguous sexuality, along with very lyrical descriptions of landscape. I'm very grateful to the writer Ken Warpole um, for introducing me, telling me about this book, A True Heart, which is set in 1873 on an isolated farm on the Essex Marshes, on an island uh, uh, which I presume is a fictional island called Derryman Island. Has anyone ever heard of a place called Derryman Island? Well, I'm quite convinced that, his, uh, that she is talking about Canvey Island here. Um, the protagonist of the novel is a maidservant called Suki and she arrives at this uh, isolated farm on this island uh, from an orphanage which is surrounded by the sea. She describes the landscape as wild and austere. The solitude of the landscape weighed upon her vision. She felt afraid of the marsh. I'm going to read a very evocative description of that marsh here. She remembered her first sight of the marsh, how it had lain outstretched and impassive, containing its secret longing for the hour when the sea fog would come flowing over it, billowing in like the sea's ghost come back to claim its own. It was small wonder that the farm and the life she led there seemed tinged with unreality. Small wonder that she felt astray from her proper self. It was dreamlike indeed that she should be washing clothes and baking bread where once the fishes swam. Herds of cattle and horses grazed over the marsh, but she did not dread these, for she soon discovered that the worst they did was to follow her snorting and inquisitive, but not intending her any harm. It was the sea itself that she dreaded. Um, I really recommend reading this book, which is set not just, let's say, shall we say, on Canvey Island, but also partly in Southend, which is described a number of times in the novel as a very middle-class town with gentry ways, where men were made to wear top hats and women had fancy dresses. In quite an amusing scene in the trip, in, in, in the novel, uh, Suki also takes a uh, misjudged trip to Shoebury Ness, where, um, which is described in, in the worst terms possible, really. <laughs> and she ends up in a dark alley, mistaken for a prostitute, and is um, brought into a brothel. Um, luckily, the madam there is a very kindly woman who realises she's a, a very naive and kind of sends her on her way with some, with some food. But for me, the most powerful sections of this, the novel are the really poetic descriptions of the Essex marshland. And then this other wonderful uh, novella, uh, the Snow Goose, which is also subtitled A Story of Dunkirk, and it was first published in 1941, and again was a huge bestseller. And it tells the story of a lonely hunchback artist who lives in an abandoned lighthouse in the marshlands of Essex, and of his friendship with a young girl who brings him an injured Canadian snow goose. I think, again, that this book is set in Canvey Island, 
particularly after I came across this uh, note in, the, in Joseph Conrad's most famous novel, Heart of Darkness, which does again mention um, the Essex coastland. And he refers uh, to kind of passing a Chapman lighthouse, which he calls a three-legged thing erect on a mud flat, which shone strongly. And notes in the back of the book state this lighthouse was built in 1849 on a, mud, on a mud flat off Canvey Island to direct shipping away from the dangerous sandbanks. It was, uh, through further research I discovered it was dismantled in 1957 after an inspection found the metal supports to be badly corroded. I don't know if anyone here remembers this, this lighthouse or... Sorry? You can still hear the bell. How extraordinary. Um, so, oh, hang on a second, my pages are not in the wrong house. So in the Snow Goose, this lighthouse is, is described as being a beacon on the Essex coast. Time shifted land and water, and its usefulness came to an end. Abandoned and derelict, it served again as a human habitation, and in it there lived a lonely man. His body was warped, but his heart was filled with love for wild and hunted things. He was ugly to look upon, but he created great beauty. <clears throat> the book is about him, and a child who came to know him, and see beyond the grotesque form that housed him, to what lay within. That is the story. And the story continues to tell um, the tale of the artist hunchback, Philip Rader, who bought the lighthouse in 1930 and lived there um, as, as a painter and, and a recluse. And he was also a great sailor and often took his boat out into the tidal creeks and estuaries around the island, sometimes for days at a time. And around the lighthouse, he built an enclosure where he kept tame geese, ducks, mallards and other wild birds and hundreds of birds rested at his sanctuary before migrating north again to breed. Gallico describes this place as one of the last wild places of England, very similar language to Robert McFarlane used, a low, far-reaching expanse of grass and reeds and half-submerged meadowlands, ending in the great saltings and the mud flats and the tidal pools near the restless sea. It's a really beautiful book, only 64 pages long, so uh, I would again advise you to uh, read it if you can. And the story continues that one day a 12 year old beautiful girl, who slender, dirty, nervous and timid as a bird, but beneath the grime as eerily beautiful as a marsh fairy, came to visit him with, with the injured snow goose. In, in her arms, which she, which, which she found kind of shot and dying, lying in the marsh. And the hunchback fixed the bird's broken leg, and over time the two developed a friendship. And every year when the bird, that when the snow goose uh, joined the migration, um, the, the girl would go uh, away, and she only came to visit when the goose came back. But when the snow goose returned to its summer home, it was as though some kind of bar was up between them, and that she did not come to the lighthouse. So up until this point, the novella is very much like a fairy story, really, um, with, with similarities to Beauty and the Beast. And then um, it's very much set within the wartime period, and, and it uh, describes how in 1940 all the birds migrated early uh, because of the sound of the bombing. And uh, the hunchbacks decides he's going to take his little boat to Dunkirk to rescue the soldiers trapped on the beach. And the girl comes to visit him and tries to stop him from going and she's, she's really afraid for him. But um, he goes anyway on this dangerous mission, saying to her, the men are huddled on the beaches like hunted birds, like the wounded and hunted birds we used to find and bring to the sanctuary. Over them fly the still peregrines, hawks and and falcons, but they have no shelter from these iron birds of prey. They are lost and storm-driven and harried. 
They need my help, my dear, as our world creatures have needed help. And that is why I must go. It is something that I can do. Yes, I can. For once, for once, I can be a man and play my part. And he goes off to Dunkirk and we hear in the story how he rescues repeatedly many men from the beaches and takes them out to the larger steamships further out. And then the narrative switches to a conversation of some soldiers um, talking about this rescue operation and how they saw this strange little hunchback man in his tiny boat um, coming out to see them and hovering around the boat was the snow goose. Um, and then the narrative switches again um, and in the final scenes we learn that he's killed in the retreat uh, from Dunkirk and the book ends with the girl, the lone figure of the girl on the marsh um, saying the first day she haunted the sea wall watching though she knew it was useless, she knew he was dead and only then does she fully realise how much she loves him. So it's a very romantic, kind of sentimental tale, um, but one which I believe is, uh, is set in Canvey Island. So, so there we go, um, some really evocative and very beautiful descriptions in fiction of our unique marsh landscape. So now I want to move on to the kind of final depiction of Southend, um, which is Southend in contemporary literature, contemporary fiction. And uh, the, the, the next uh, speaker I'd like to introduce you to is uh, the author, uh, the, the chairman of the Authors Club, the literary critic and writer Chris Schuler who's going to talk to us about another extraordinary novel um, which features South End. So a warm hand please for Chris Schumer. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, Norbert Gestrein is not exactly a household name in this country. Uh, he's uh, very well regarded in his native Austria and Germany but few of his books have been translated. I came across this book, The English Years, almost 10 years ago when it was sent me to review, and it has been translated by the incomparable Anthea Bell. It is a, a rather Zebaldian tale, and not surprisingly it actually has a, 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 some praise from W.G. Zebald himself on the front, about... Um, a man who flees to Britain from Austria after the Anschluss and is interned as an enemy alien on the Isle of Man. This immediately struck a chord with me because uh, when my father and his brother first came to this country to escape from Nazi Germany, they were... Can you all hear that? <laughs> yes, OK. Uh, when my father and his brother first came to this country, they, they were interned as enemy aliens. My uncle on the Isle of Man and my father on at Lingfield Racecourse. When the novel begins, uh, the protagonist, Gabriel Hirschfeld, has died uh, after living for many years in Southend-on-Sea as a kind of eminent cantankerous recluse, the author of a highly reputed work on uh, the Jewish experience of emigration and then nothing else for many, many years. The narrator, who's an unnamed Austrian woman, goes in search of him to Southend and meets up with his third wife, I believe, his surviving widow. Um, it was Sunday and clear weather when I visited her in Southend-on-Sea. I had bought newspapers at Piccadilly Circus and expected to spend a couple of idle hours by the sea, walking in the fresh air, perhaps on the promenade, with children squealing like piglets, tugging their suburban parents from one tacky stall to the next, a scene that Hirschfelder must have observed time and time again. 
I was touched to find her standing by herself on the station platform in her red and white polka dot dress to meet me, and I felt that for some reason or other she was reluctant to take me to the library where he had worked until his retirement, a brick box of a building on the main road, brooding in the bright sunlight with a faint humming sound. But when it turned out to be closed, she seemed sorry that she couldn't show me the place. A little later, I was walking beside her, following his daily route along the high street, which looked as dead as a small town in a western after a bandit raid. <laughs> a cat curled up in a doorway, a drunk peeing in a flower bed, and bits of paper blown against the iron gratings over the shop fronts, although the air was perfectly still. On the domed roof of a dilapidated building, I saw the word Kursaal in German, and there stood the hotel. I'll read one other reading extract. It is difficult to imagine Hirschfelder sitting in the second floor room where he worked every afternoon, untouched by the changes around him, perhaps not even noticing that the former luxury hotel had become a cheap, shabby place which you entered through the back door. I don't know when he first took the room, but it seems likely that in his early days there he would have encountered the last of the regular guests in the corridors, white-collar workers who wanted, for once in their lives, to sleep with their wives in a bed which, half a century earlier, a banker had considered suitable for himself and his mistress, the celebrity of the season and the West End theatre. Flashy people, these latecomers, who ordered cheap meals from the harassed waiters in the dining room, eating from the china used in the past by a baron and baroness. For you only had to go back far enough in the visitor's book to see the most illustrious names flung into the air like a handful of confetti. A few ladies and gentlemen of the upper classes probably still looked in now and then, staying the night elsewhere but taking a nostalgic stroll into their past, over the worn carpets, glancing into the empty ballroom as if memory alone were enough to conjure up a ballerina pirouetting to the strains of a string orchestra. And if he wasn't deaf to such echoes, then he must have picked up some of them, or a hint of the ghostly life in the billiard room, crammed with tables and chairs, or in the bar with its spotted mirrors showing the faces of the figures who haunted my fantasies, gentlemen in top hats and tails, ladies with feather boas or cigarette holders, and hairstyles plastered to their heads. But before the time came, when whole coach parties of pensioners would descend on the poor, maltreated building. Standing on a rise high above the beach, it must sometimes have looked to him by night, like a ship run aground, I told myself, whether brightly lit or already dark, a vessel seeming to rock slowly in the autumn wind, an old crate lurching in a leisurely manner, groaning as it deviated from the perpendicular above, the, uh, uh, sorry, groaning as it deviated from the perpendicular above the milling throng of weekend visitors, and stopping with a creak only at twilight. The comings and goings on the esplanade in front of the hotel would have died away. The hooting of horns, the noise from the gaming rooms, and, if I try hard, I can still see him standing at his window, its glass smeared as if by the sea spray. I imagine him lingering there, raising his eyes above the struts of the amusement park that reared up grotesquely in the darkness, looking out at the bobbing lights at the mouth of the Thames and the pier, said to be the longest in the world, where the narrow-gauge railway train would set off with a playful rattle in the daytime, as if to carry its passengers on when it reached the end, out over the water and into the sky. <laughs> introduce our next speaker, I just want to find this very tiny excerpt from uh, Sebastian Falk's Birdsong. Um, there's a little 
But the, this uh, book, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, was uh, published in 1993, uh, recently adapted into a BBC TV series, and has sold over three million copies. Um, it's, it's a love story, really, that begins in northern France in 1910, when an Englishman, Stephen Raisford, on attachment from London, lodges with the Azair family, where he falls in love with his host's second wife, Isabel, a young woman of unfulfilled hopes. Stephen and Isabel have an affair. She becomes pregnant, and they flee to Provence, but she later leaves him. The story follows Stephen as an infantry soldier in Flanders in 1916 on the Western Front. And throughout the war, Stephen writes a coded journal where he expresses his true feelings. Decades later, this diary is found by his granddaughter, Elizabeth Benson, who eventually decodes it and starts to track down any living survivors mentioned in her grandfather's diary. In this excerpt, set in the 1970s, she visits a former member of Stephen's pl platoon in a Star and Garter veterans' home in South End. Hang on, I've got to find another page. Elizabeth was compelled to take the train from Fenchurch Street, one of British Rail's recent corridor corridorless variety, with new orange plush on the seats. She bought a cup of coffee down the rocking carriage, wincing as the boiling fluid seeped out from under the lid and onto her hand. When it was cool enough to drink, she found its taste merge into the atmosphere of diesel fumes and cigarette ends, so it was hard to tell where one ended and the next began. The heating was turned up full, and most of the people in the carriage seemed on the point of unconsciousness as they looked out of the window at the flatlands of Essex sliding past. Elizabeth had telephoned the matron of the home, who told her that Brennan was barely worth visiting, but that he would see her if she came. She felt excited by the prospect of actually meeting someone from that era, she would be like a historian who, after working from other histories, finally lays hands on original source material. She had an unclear picture of Brennan in her mind, although she knew he would be old, and to judge from what the matron had said, decrepit. Yet still, she envisaged him in uniform with a gun. It was raining when she emerged from the station in South End. She opened the door of a blue Vauxhall taxi in the forecourt. The car moved off over the glistening streets, along the front with its long, dejected pier and crumbling Regency hotels. As they went up the hill, the driver pointed out towards the sands, where a cockle boat was fishing with an attachment that looked like a giant vacuum hose trailing over the edge. The home was a large Victorian building of red brick, just visible beneath the pattern of fire escapes. Elizabeth paid the driver and went inside. There were stone steps leading up to a reception desk. Huge, high-ceiling corridors led off in either direction. The receptionist was a plump woman with a mauve cardigan and tortoiseshell glasses. Is he expecting you? Yes, I think so. I spoke to the matron. The receptionist dialed two digits on the telephone. Yes, visitor for Brennan. All right. She put the phone down. Someone will come for you, she said to Elizabeth. She picked up the magazine she'd been reading. Elizabeth looked down and brushed a crumb from her skirt. A woman in a nurse's uniform came up and introduced herself. You're for Brennan, aren't you? Please step into my office. They went a few yards down the corridor into a small overheated room with filing cabinets. There was a calendar on the wall with a picture of a kitten in a basket. You haven't been here before, have you? said Mrs Simpson. She was a surprisingly young woman with peroxide hair and red lipstick. What you have to understand is that some of the men have been here almost all their lives. This is all they know, all they remember. She stood up and took a file up from the cabinet. Yes, here we are. He was admitted in 1919, or Mr Brennan. Discharged in 1921. Returned 1923. He's been here ever since, paid for by the government. No surviving family. Um, Elizabeth realises that no one has been to visit him for 60 years. And she goes to talk to him 
um, doesn't really recover too much information. And afterwards, she stood on the road that overlooked the water, breathing gulps of salty air in the rain, digging her fingernails into the palms of her hand. She'd rescued some vital connection. She'd been successful in her small errand. What she could not do, which made her curse and wring her hands, was restore poor Brennan's life or take away the pity of the past. Okay, so that's just a tiny excerpt there from Birdsong. Now, it's my really great pleasure to introduce a live and living uh, local legend, uh, the author Sid Moore, who last year published to great acclaim her book, uh, The Drowning Pool, um, which is set very much within this landscape. So please, a warm welcome for Sid Moore. Hi. Um, thank you, Rachel. This is um, a ghost story, but it is also very much um, a bit of a love, a love song to Lee, I think. So much so that when I was writing my second book, I asked the publishers, do you want me to set it in Lee again, because you loved it? And they said, oh no, set it in some other quaint Essex village. So it's set in Chilkwell. <laughs> <laughs> but this one is set in Lee. Um, and the, I'm reading from the beginning of the book, um, and this is a scene in which um, Sarah Gray, um, the main character, and three of her friends have decided to relive their youth and go up to Happy Castle, have a bottle of wine and tell stories. Um, <clears throat> okay. We were sat on the bushy grass in the shadow of Hadley Castle. Well, I use the term castle, but that's an exaggeration. It's been around since the 13th century, but is little more than a ruin. One and a half towers and an assortment of odd stones. As dusk ebbed in tonight, I could just make out to my left the white boarded fishermen co fishermen's cottages that speckled the dark slopes of Lee, from the jagged tooth of St Clement's Church down to the cockle sheds on the waterfront. Scores of miniature boats nestled in the cradle of the bay. Around us, the hawthorns of Hadley whispered in the breeze like softly crashing waves. Corinne suggested we build a fire. Her husband, Pat, is into that survival rubbish. Consequently, she has a talent for coaxing fire out of the most stubborn wood and fragments. As the last of the twilight disappeared, she did herself proud, which was perfect timing because the moon was on the rise now and the air had chilled. There were no clouds, and away from the fog of orange street lights, out there on the hunchbacked hill, the icy light of the summer constellations was clear and bright. <coughs> Moon shadows were everywhere. The tide had come in around the marsh of Two Tree Island, and the gentle ting ting of moored boats drifted up to us from Benfleet Creek. Across the estuary, the pinprick lights of North Kent villages blinked like hundreds of tiny, nervous eyes. I remember Sharon saying how much she loved the view, apart from the industrial plant on Canvey Island. That's a bloody eyesore, she said. Martha threw a fag butt into the fire and said, well, I like it. It's a contrast, industry versus romance. It's ugly, Sharon answered. This place is a constable painting. Then you see that, it's rank. People always got this wrong. True, Constable captured the castle in oils. I saw a sketch of it once at the Tate. But it wasn't one of his romantic idylls. Painted after his wife's death, he had picked out browns the colour of crumbling leaves. Livid raven blacks, dismal ash greys. The castle, a skeletal ruin, was desolate and alone. And the sky was strange. If you looked at it closely, you could see Constable's brushstrokes were all over the place. The air was turbulent, full of dark storm clouds, pregnant with terrible power, like something was in them, waiting to come through. I sensed that when I first saw the picture, and I just know Constable felt it too. Back then, in the 1820s, she would have been young and beautiful. She used to wander there often to escape the town. Maybe they met. 
So anyway, Sharon blah blah's about the rural prisoners being scarred, and Martha's on about nature and industrialisation. Then I say something about how the biggest chimney, which has the ball of gas burning above it, reminds me of Mordor, the Eye of Sauron, to be precise. I kind of like its otherworldliness, I said. And Sharon went, ooh, hock at you, Mrs. Spooky. And everyone laughed. I don't mean it frightens me. I knew I sounded like a petulant teen. The wine had fired my blood. But there's plenty of other things round here that do. Sharon must have heard my indignant tone because she was straight in and pacifying me with platitudes. Yeah, she said, I know. Not all the local history's quaint. She shot a look at Corin. Isn't this place meant to have something to do with an old Earl's murder? We all looked at Corin, who shrugged. Though not related, Sharon and Corin's families were inextricably intertwined in the way that happens when generations are content to live in the same place for a good length of time. Corin came from a very oldly family, so we automatically deferred to her on all local matters. Probably, she said, I know a mysterious lead coffin was set down on Lee Beach around that time. Some locals had that it was a murdered nobleman. My dad always said it was the body of Thomas, Duke of Gloucester, who had been killed by Richard II's men in, Richard II's men in Calais. He was strangled with a sheet so violently that his head was severed. The coffin was whisked up to the castle. The next day it vanished. How awfully sinister, said Martha, and took a long swig of her wine. Sharon coughed on her fag and told everyone that St Clement's steps creeped her out. This was a steep pathway that connected the old town on the seafront to the newer parts mm. higher up. I always feel like I'm going to have a bloody heart attack when I get to the top. And people have done, you know. They used to try to bring coffins up by a different route, which wasn't at such a sharp angle. But then some posh bloke built a new house and closed that road off as he wanted a bigger garden. It was the Reverend Robert Eden, actually, said Corin, and it wasn't exactly a house. He built a new rectory as the old one was falling down. It houses the library now. Right, said Sharon, completely disinterested. Anyway, everyone in the old town had to start using the step to get the bodies up to the church, but it was so steep a few of the pool bearers started popping their clogs at their men's funerals. Imagine that. The, my neighbour swears blind, Churchill is haunted. She punctuated the sentence with a Vincent Price cackle. We all looked at Corinne again. This time she smiled. Perhaps it is. For such a small place, this town has lots of stories. There was Princess Beatrice way back in the 13th century, daughter of Henry III. He arranged for her to marry a Spanish count, but she fell in love with a local man, Ralph de Binley, and ran away to Lee to elope. Someone found out, and they caught the couple on Strand Wolf. Ralph was sent off to Colchester, accused of murder, but managed to escape back here, where he was banished from England, never to return. Some say, on clear nights, you can see Beatrice out on the wolf, waiting for her lover, pacing up and down, crying her eyes out. I didn't want melancholy tales on a drinking night. I was about to make some kind of glib comment to lighten the tone, but Sharon got in before me. Pass me the bucket, she said. That's not spooky. I thought we were doing spooky. Corinne looked put out again, so I grabbed the wine and refilled her. She fixed her eyes on me, like a cat noticing a wounded pigeon for the first time. Her eyes widened, and she paused theatrically, then said, Aha! Uh -huh. Well, if you want spooky... Her fingers made a kind of flourishing gesture in my direction. Look no further than our namesake here, Sarah Moore. I groaned and rolled my eyes. I shared my name with a local character in the pub named after her. There was lots of mileage in this one. The other Sarah Moore, Corinne grinned and poked me in the ribs, was a right old witch. Have you heard the tale, Sarah? Of course I had. I couldn't move around the town without someone making a lewd comment about me doing favours for sailors. But Sharon piped up that she didn't know the whole story, and Martha wanted the gory details, so Corinne drew us close to the fire and asked if we were sitting comfortably. Then I'll begin, she whispered in a proper storyteller's voice. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you so much. Um, I know it's very hot and uncomfortable sitting here. Um, so tonight I've shared with you just, just a few of uh, the, the wonderful little treasures, uh, fictional excerpts that I found about South End. And I don't know if anyone has brought anything along with them that they'd like to share. Have I missed anything out? Does anyone know of anything else? Um, well, if you do, uh, later on, um, please do let me know. Um, stay a while and uh, have, have another look in the bookshop and uh, have another glass of wine. Um, I'd just like to really thank you all very much for coming along tonight. And, um, and a very big thank you to Metal for, and the whole team for hosting this wonderful event. Um, so thank you very much and a particular big thank you to, um, to Emma and Steph um, and Camilla for, for making all this beautiful food that we've had tonight. Um, I think we've all been hosted really well and a very big thank you um, to the Book Inn as well. Uh, for bringing along all those wonderful uh, local history books. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the evening and I hope you'll come along to the next Salon event. Um, you should find on your chair a leaflet um, about it. We're going to have uh, three speakers and I'm actually going to be reading on the night from my new book which I've just spent the last five years uh, writing. It's called um, Diamond Street, The Hidden world of Hatton Garden, um, which is quite self-explanatory, but it will be launching actually here um, before it launches in London on that night. And we've got two other really exceptional um, contemporary uh, writers coming along on that evening. Uh, Sukhdev Sandhu is coming all the way from New York to uh, join us. He's a, a very well-renowned film critic, writer and, and lecturer. And he's going to be speaking about this uh, extraordinary project called Night Haunts, where he uh, f followed in the footsteps of various Londoners who work through the night. So he was kind of down in the sewers with the sewer flushers. He was up with the uh, helicopter police at night. He spent a night in a convent. Really amazing book. And the other speaker coming is uh, Craig Taylor, who's recently released a book who's full title is Londoners, the Days and Nights of London Now, as told by those who love it, hate it, live it, left it and long for it. And uh, during this uh, remarkable book, which was released very recently, very highly acclaimed, big bestseller, um, he interviewed over 200 people who kind of live in the city now. So I do hope that you will um, join me and I'd just like you all to give a very big hand to our fantastic readers who've come along tonight, so thank you.